Whereas we wait for a few more folks to log on here, I'm going to put back up this quote from the large catechism, just so you can ponder here. We can ponder, contemplate, uh, what is idolatry? You know, that's the question that we're answering here, that we're looking for as we snort around in all the corners and edges of human life and find that idolatry is lurking everywhere. One last check of my notes here. Okay, 9.15, there we go. We're on. Welcome everybody to the last of our summer uh, online Bible studies. Lord willing, we'll be able to hold, we're gonna host some sort of hybrid Bible study probably uh, beginning September 13th. I'm not sure exactly what that'll look like. Perhaps something that's live streamed available in person as well as online. So stay tuned for more details about that. Anyways, we're working today at the end of this this long Bible study on idols and idolatry. And I just always think it's good for us to review what do we mean when we talk about idolatry. You have here Luther in the large catechism on the first commandment talks at length about, he really puts his finger on what idolatry is. So he says, uh, this is what you are to do. Search and examine your own heart, heart thoroughly and you will discover whether or not it clings to God alone. If you have the sort of heart that expects from him nothing but good, especially in distress and need, and renounces and forsakes all that is not God, then you have the one true God. On the contrary, if your heart clings to something else and expects to receive from it more good and help than from God, and does not run to God but flees from him when things go wrong, then you have another God, an idol. So Luther even will go so far as to say it is the heart that makes a God or an idol. And by that, he does not mean that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is himself only a figment of our imagination or something that we make up. Not at all. What he means is that, that idolatry is a condition of the heart. And if your heart is not set on the one true God, on Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and particularly on the revelation of his gospel and salvation that is found in the sacrificial death and atonement and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you have a false God. So idolatry is not, you know, when we're little kids, we maybe we're misled into thinking that idolatry is like Baal worship or bowing down to little idols, so on and so forth. I was, it was, it took me until my vicar year before I actually saw like that kind of idolatry in action. I was in a Hindu, a Hindu home and there on uh, one corner in the wall, in their living room, they had their little, their little gods and their little dishes where they put the food out in front of the gods to feed the ancestors, so on and so forth. You know, we get this idea that that's what idolatry is, and we fail to recognize that idolatry is not about, about graven images or something like that. It's about the heart. It's the condition of the heart, and that's what we've been looking at. And today, as we wrap up, we're going to particularly examine the uh, way that wisdom or knowledge or science can become an idol. So that's an interesting topic. It, when you think about this quote from Luther, um, here it is, if your heart clings to something else and expects to receive from it more good and help than from God, then you have an idol. So if you are looking for, uh, Bill and Faith say they can't hear me. Okay. Everybody else can hear me? Good. Okay. I see a thumbs up from a few people who are willing to show their faces on a Sunday morning. So, um, so you know, when it comes to wisdom or science, so on and so forth, this, if this is what we start to look to for all good and help in life, like my smarts, my brains, my ability to figure the world out, well then, and my trust, my confidence is straying from the one true God, and it's headed down the path 
of idolatry. So it should be an interesting topic. I want to start by simply uh, going through some scriptures that uh, cover a number of topics related to this, and we'll get a good scriptural basis going. And then after that, we're going to dive into some of the hard questions, especially in our day and age, when you know, like when you get in your car and you see the yard signs that say science is real, what's going on? We got to talk about that. So here we go. I got a list of scriptures and I don't know that I actually stopped and thought about what order we should take them in, but we're going to just take them in the order here. So let me, let me, I got to stop share here. Yeah. Let me get onto my Bible app. Where is it? There we go. That's what I want. There, everybody can see my Bible now. Shrink that down a little bit. First Samuel 28. Talk about the, the uh, idolatrous or poor use of wisdom, trying to gain knowledge. This is one of the ways that the idol of wisdom or whatever knowledge presents itself is trying to gain access to things that have been hidden from us or that are hidden in the mind of God. You know, if you want to know the future, then you are you're essentially idolizing knowledge or the foreknowledge. You know what I mean? Like this is something that belongs to God. God and God alone knows everything. And if we want to go beyond what he's revealed to us and, uh, you know, we want, essentially, we want to take a slice out of the divine for ourselves. We want to know the future. So you probably remember this. It's, of course, it's one of the most exciting Bible stories when you're in grade school and they tell you all about it because it gets all creepy and you get, you know, you get the witch and so on and so forth. But basically, here's what happened. Samuel, the prophet Samuel had died. And Samuel was the one that Saul consulted for advice, so on and so forth. So he's got a, he's facing a battle. He's got a problem. He's trying to decide, should I fight or should I not? This was an, a common problem in the ancient world. You know, they didn't have the same kind of recon or intel that we have. Saul couldn't log on to a satellite imagery and look from a spy satellite to see what kind of forces the Philistines had. And so in the ancient world, you find you run across this all over the place. How do you decide whether or not to attack? Like the, in the Roman Navy, the way that the Roman uh, sailors decided whether or not they should engage was they would get some chickens out on the deck. They would throw down some uh, seed for the chickens and they would watch the way the chickens pecked. And if they pecked furiously at the seed, it was an omen that they should attack. But if the chickens were just kind of like, and eh, not real interested in eating, then they decided, okay, we better not attack. So this is what Saul wants. He wants some sort of sign, some sort of answer. Should I attack or should I not? But um, Samuel's dead and Saul had done a good thing. He'd put the mediums, that is those who try to connect us to the dead, the necromancers, you know, people who are trying to, to access realms beyond the realm of the living. Saul's done a good thing and put them all out of the land. Well, now he wants one. He's afraid. His heart trembles greatly. The Lord does not answer him either by dreams or by the Urim. That was, those were the stones, the lot stones that were kept on the breastplate of the high priest or by the prophets. So God's silent. You know, he gives Saul no answer. So what does he do? Uh-oh, Saul. He turns for a medium. I want to go and inquire of her. And his servants go and say, okay, you can find one at Endor. So not the moon from Star Wars, by the way, Star Wars fans. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. So he disguises himself. And now he has his request, divine for me a spirit, bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. And the woman says, hold on a second. You're trying to lay a trap for me. How do I know I can trust you? You know, that you're not, you're not an undercover officer of Saul. And Saul actually swears, you know, now he takes this oath, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. And he wants Samuel brought up. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. The woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Now suddenly the ruse is, is revealed. The king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? I see a God coming up out of the earth. And an old man is coming up wrapped in a robe. And what does Samuel want? Uh, Samuel, or what does Saul want? He says, I'm in great distress. God has turned away from me. Tell me what I shall do. He wants this secret knowledge, you know, and we don't know. Everybody speculates what's going on here. Does God really send Samuel back from the dead? Well, that's a possibility. Is this Satan masquerading and pulling uh, deceit upon people? That's a possibility. It appears as though you know, oftentimes mediums, psychiatrists, so on, and, or not psych, psychics, uh, mediums and psychics, so on and so forth, they simply play off their keen understanding of human nature and they say enough things that sound 
uh, ambiguous and yet specific enough to make people think they know what they're talking about. It does appear as though uh, this, this is not just a case of this woman practicing this craft of manipulation. She herself, I think the reason why people say that is because she herself is surprised. Like she's, she cries out with a loud voice. She's surprised, like, like she's done this before, but nobody's ever actually shown up or something like that. We don't know, you know, where does this, where does this woman lie? Maybe she is, you know, in cahoots with Satan and, and uh, Satan uses these visions or apparitions. None of that really matters for our discussion today. The point I want to make is simply when you start to seek knowledge apart from the right and proper and God-pleasing way that he has revealed knowledge to us, you are trying to slice off some of his own divine nature for yourself. And that's a problem that we find in our day and age as well. When we think about the, the world we live in and some of the knowledge that we want whether it's knowledge of the future, whether it's knowledge of the origins of this world, whether it's knowledge of like the purpose or overwhelming um, you know, metaphysical realities, narratives, stuff like that, we can perhaps sometimes fall into this trap of wanting what God has chosen in his wisdom to withhold from us. So, um, I, or I guess, you know, if you want the moralistic Sunday school lesson, don't visit a medium. Okay, there, that was easy. Don't visit a medium, right? The rule, whenever it comes to anything that has to do with the occult, Satan, witchcraft, medium, so on and so forth, the same, the basic rule always applies. Every kid who's been in my catechism class knows it. Stay away. That's the rule. Just stay away. You might get more than you bargained for. All right, let's shift gears here. Um, if there aren't, unless there are questions on that, if there are questions, go ahead and unmute yourself, shout it out, or type it into the chat window. I am monitoring the chat window. I can see that. So if you have a question, um, go ahead and type it in there. Um, moving on to Psalm 8 is, uh, there are many Psalms, of course, that talk about the splendor and the majesty of creation, or you might think about the last chapters of the book of Job, the speeches that the Lord makes to Job. And uh, I thought I thought about Psalm 8 in regard to the the topic of science in um, simply because it affirms the value we have in examining the world that God has given to us. So like science is not evil. Actually, it's uh, the best science is a very good and God pleasing thing, you know. So uh, the verse I'm particularly thinking at is verse three, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers. And what a marvelous picture that is, by the way, you know, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. So you go out on a starry night and you see the whole host of the heavens arrayed above you in all of their splendor. You see the moon, you see all the stars, you see the planets moving around. Maybe you see a comet, like the comet that came through this summer. And you look at all of that and you take it in. And uh, then he says, this is God's finger work. You know, like a little old lady who's knitting something by the fire in winter. This is what it took for God to set the moon and the stars in the sky. I think that's such a cool image. But um, I, bring this, I bring this passage up here simply because this person is looking at the heavens, right? Like we can look at the world that God made and there is nothing wrong with that. We can actually learn a lot of it. Goes, it goes on, um, the son of man that you care for him, talking uh, ultimately about Christ, um, but talking about all of us as well, you know, so I look out at the great expanse of the heavens and we human beings are just tiny little specks of dust, um, not even visible in the great and incredible universe we live in. And yet God cares for us. You've made us a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor, given dominion over the works of your hands, put all things under his feet. This is referring to Christ, right? And in a lesser way, it refers to all of us in the, the way that God set Adam and Eve over the earth and said, have dominion over it. Now, dominion does not mean dominance, but it does mean this kind of authority over the world that actually opens up and legitimizes the scientific task of inquiry. We should look at the world God had made, has made. We should study it. We should learn about it. Uh, we should, you know, work with our minds and with our hands to craft tools and stuff that are helpful for us, so on and so forth. All of that is totally legitimate and perfectly fine. And to add one more. Uh, passage here. Let me skip up to Luke chapter 12, where uh, Jesus makes an interesting little observation. Uh, yeah, he says, he says to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret 
the present time. Okay, so Jesus, this is not the main point he's making, but the, the point that he's making depends on the reality of the scientific task, that we can observe the world God has made, that we find patterns and like laws of nature in it, and that uh, they, you know, they prove to be fairly reliable. So, I mean, meteorology, of course, is notoriously unreliable, and yet it happen, it's effective often enough that we find it useful and we still have um, weather reports, weather stations, so on and so forth. Well, the ancient world, they had this too. They knew that if you see the clouds rising in the west, it's going to rain. If the south wind's blowing, it's going to get hot, so on and so forth. Again, I bring these passages up simply to say that there is absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, it is what God wants us to do if we are to apply our brain power to observing the world. The problem is when it becomes an idol, when we start crossing that line into asking questions that we cannot answer because they remain hidden in the mind of God. They're part of God's hidden will, not part of his revealed will. Um, his revealed will, of course, is in Holy Scripture, in the natural knowledge of God that we might have, you know, the ability that we have to understand and interpret this world doesn't so much give us insight into um, our, I mean, it gives us insight into the wisdom of God, I guess, not so much into the beating heart of his grace or something like that. All right, questions or comments on that one? So let's move to let's move to 1 Corinthians 8. There's another problem that you can have with knowledge, and it's this that knowledge puffs up but loves build up. So the specific issue here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is in regards to the sacrificial offerings that were a common part of the Greco-Roman world. So you have a temple, people bring their offerings to the idols. And uh, I think we often imagine that like the whole animal is burned up, but that was actually a rarity. The whole, the whole burnt offering is a rarity. Most of the offerings were only a certain part of the animal. The rest of the animal then was butchered and you went and you got your meat from the temple there where the animals were brought, offered to the idols. And on the side, they're selling ribeyes and T-bones, and New York strips, so on and so forth. And this caused a great controversy in the early Christian church. Can we eat that meat that is sacrificed to idols? Or are we, by so doing, are we actually endorsing the idol worship? And uh, Paul is going to say here, well, there, the, the, uh, the idols are nothing, so you know there is no God but one. So yes, we can. We could eat this food without uh, any problem, but not everybody has this knowledge. All of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. So here, as we talk about knowledge, I guess we, we can think about this kind of aspect to the idolatry or the idolatrous pursuit of knowledge, wisdom, science, so on and so forth. If our pursuit is an attempt to puff ourselves up, you know, to gain some sort of extra advantage for ourselves rather than to grow in our ability to love and serve others, we're probably idolizing knowledge, you know, and we've all met people like this in our, in our uh, school days or even in our careers. We meet people who uh, possess knowledge and make sure that everybody else knows it so that they can get puffed up, so on and so forth. So uh, that would be another indicator or a clue that our pursuit of knowledge is, is trending towards idolatry. You know, I was talking with one of the scientists in our congregation this week about this topic, and, and they made this interesting observation. They said, you know, the, the reality is that we're all wrong about something. <laughs> Everybody's wrong about something. You know, probably we're wrong about many things. The real problem is we don't always know what it is that we're wrong about <laughs> and trying to sort that out. Like, what am, where am I off base? What am I wrong about? Having that kind of humility that realizes I don't know everything is going to go a long way to keeping us safe from falling into the trap of an idolatrous pursuit of knowledge. And so to wrap up our little quick uh, overview of the scriptures here, let me take you to Psalm 131. Ah, I just love this Psalm, the song of ascent. So these are Psalms there's a number of them that were 
songs that were sung while people were ascending into the city of Jerusalem and going to the Temple Mount for worship. So the Jerusalem is set up on a hill. In order to go to it, you have to go up. And there are these series of short psalms that would be recited or sung while you were making that pilgrimage. They're really lovely. This one in particular is a lovely one. So it says, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. So when it comes to the pursuit of knowledge, here it is. The confession is, I recognize that I am a creature. And as a creature, I will not be able to understand or know everything. I can't wrap my mind around God. If I could, he wouldn't be God. I would be. So I'm, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. And the psalm writer goes on with this beautiful comparison. I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. So the picture here is of the, these travelers ascending to the Temple Mount, and one of them is a mother, and the mother is carrying her toddler, you know, big enough to no longer be nursing, but young enough that this child is just content to be with mom. The child doesn't know where they're going. The child doesn't understand everything about the journey. The child doesn't understand the destination. The child knows that everything is okay. Why? Because I'm with mom. You can imagine this woman carrying this child on her back as they go up to the Temple Mount. And what a beautiful picture. You know, we don't have to know everything about this world. Why? Because we're, we have God. You know, God is with us, carrying us, walking alongside us every step of the way. So our souls uh, within us can be like that wean child that has just that awesome, overwhelming trust in, in God, even though there are many things in this world that I am not going to comprehend, even though there are things that I am wrong about and I don't always know what they are. It's okay. I can, I can keep going with peace and quiet. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. All right. Um, well, like I said, Dolly, you just buckle up and I'll take it from here. Questions, comments. I see the yeah, henners are wondering about ribeyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, man, give me a, give me a good old ribeye steak. That's now we're talking. Mm. Good stuff. Uh, questions, comments. Yeah, I know I'm salivating and it's only nine 30 in the morning. You can't be thinking about steak dinner right now. Well, I mean, the ancient Israelites were not going to be eating bacon, guys. So, you know, that's, <laughs> oh, Mark prefers filet mignon. Yeah, the great tenderloin. Yeah, God just put some marvelous cuts of meat on a, on a cow. Man, beef cattle. This summer, we drove out to South Dakota. And, you know, the, the uh, psalm verse that says, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. You know, that's what you, when you drive through South Dakota, that's what you see is cattle on a thousand hills and all that beef standing out in the field. Man, good stuff. All right. Let's get into some more specific applications now. So basically what we've learned from this is that there is a right and appropriate use of the brains that God has given us. And so long as we remain within those bounds of right and appropriate, we are not going to turn wisdom, knowledge, or the scientific method into an idol, as if through it we can divine or ascertain some sort of knowledge that is going to allow us to uh, step into the role of God and assume authority over others or find out things about the future that are known only to God, so on and so forth. That's kind of the basic gist of what we want to cover today. So there are these yard signs out now, and the yard sign, they all, they all say, science is real. My question is, what are they implying? I mean, like that, that statement on the surface is foolish. I mean, of course, science is real. Everybody knows it. Like you can open up your eyes and see it. It's in front of your eyes everywhere. But what is, what's the implication? Like what's that really meant to communicate when this yard sign says science is real? What are they implying? Yeah, that foolish Christians don't believe in science. I see. Okay. Oh, the Henners are going back to that. Yeah, that the Psalm 131, that's a really nice picture. Scientists are right, but the Bible is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I think that implication is there. That um, 
that I guess maybe a little more, you yeah, know, implying that science is everything. Um, I guess maybe uh, I wonder if it's if it's that like this idea that um, in order to be a religious person, you have to disavow all science. And you know what? I think sometimes we play into that hand if we're not careful, and if we if we do more or less just disavow science because we don't like what it says, then we might play into that hand, you know. And then we might we might do this: make a you make a yard sign. Okay, you're like okay, well, this fires me up, so I'm going to make a yard sign. And on your yard sign, you scrawl, "Religion is real." What are you implying then? <laughs> Why would you put that sign up in your yard? religion is real. I mean, again, the statement is foolish. Like you drive around, you see the churches. Yeah. Religion is a real thing. Yeah. Science is a real thing. You can go through, uh, what would be, what would be the implication there? If somebody would make a sign like that. My dog is bigger than your dog. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, sure. Which religion? Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. There's this whole, I mean, this is a long, lengthy debate of faith versus science or whatever. Yeah. Um, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah, that's basically what I think it says. Religion is real is like, I'm right, you're wrong. So it's an unnuanced view. I think we need a little more nuanced view here. So I've been thinking this through. I mean, is, in your opinion, is, uh, before I get to this last question, is science a legitimate idol in our day and age? Like, do people idolize science? Do you think that happens? And if so, I guess, how, do you, how would you recognize that? Like, when, where, where might you find someone who idolizes science? Constantly, okay, so constantly following someone who changes their mind every month. Yeah, right, I mean, like, the by definition, the scientific inquiry is going to include change as we gain knowledge, you know, it corrects and changes. But, um, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're uh, like, mindlessly following that. We have non-scientists making laws and claiming they come from science. Um, interesting, yeah, right. So now, right now, in our current situation, we have this, we have this, um, intersection not of faith and science but of politics and science and um, politics and science you know are it, that's an interesting mix in and of itself so uh ooh, things are getting spicy and exciting around here absolutely we see public television telling us of issues occurring three years three million years ago all the time yeah i yeah there is definitely an idolatrous pursuit of knowledge or science or certainty that is out there in our world. I don't know that it's that great of a threat to Christians. Um, I guess it's a crest. It's a. Th I think that um, you would find this idolatrous pursuit of science from people who are not Christians or from people who whose version of Christianity is to just go along with the prevailing winds of the culture, the society. There you might find it. But anybody who who takes God's word seriously, I'm guessing, probably doesn't have this real um, issue with making science into an idol. So maybe I'm, a, I'm, I guess I've already given my opinion. In your opinion, which is a bigger threat to Christians to idolize science or to categorically reject it, you know, to say, well, I'm a Christian, so I don't need to listen to, you know, science has nothing to offer at all, so on and so forth. Um, I guess in my opinion, that seems like perhaps that's a bigger threat is that sometimes we throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak here, and we wind up, um, you know, making claims that, that uh, maybe are not the best. I don't know. Do you, you have anybody have any opinions on that? Um, have you found that to be something that, that sometimes works against Christians, this kind of categorical rejection of it? Some do, many who don't have a secure or informed faith are trying to figure it out or cope with attacks on their faith. Yeah, that's, I think you're right about that too, Tamar, that um, uh, people, people are all across the board and 
um, well, the reality is, I guess all of us use science like every day, you know, the technology that we have is, is been made available because people have, you know, observed the world that we're in, figured things out and uh, work to create the stuff that we use, the tools that we use day in and day out. Um, if you, yeah, if you're trying to figure things out, if your faith is kind of shaky, yeah, you might, who knows where you'll wind up on that spectrum back and forth, but. Anybody, can you, anybody think or give me a, a time when you've said, oh man, I don't know if Christians have done more harm than good by simply categorically rejecting science. Saying the Bible doesn't say one plus one equals two is foolish. Okay, yeah, when we start to use the, the Bible as a science textbook, that's a problem. You know, God's word is not given to us to, in order to answer our, our scientific curiosity. And sometimes I'm afraid that, that uh, um, Christians might, you know, we might fall into that trap of saying, well, the, the Bible is going to answer every single question I have. Well, it doesn't. You know, God only reveals so much to us about this world and about himself. So, um, yeah, and Tamar says, as Christians, we need to be able to dialogue in the scientific world so that souls may be saved. That, I think, is that's, that's something I see where when uh, if you are, I mean, if you're going to debate with somebody on the basis of science, um, you better be careful, you know, make sure that you know what you're talking about so you don't wind up sounding like a fool, you know. Um, uh, I, my, what, I, what I've come back to or what I worry about is if uh, kids in our, as they grow up and they come through our church, maybe they come through our school, if they walk away with this idea that all science is just a bunch of hooey and that nobody else has it figured out and we're the only ones who have everything right. And uh, then they get to college and high school or college and they discover there's a lot of really smart, put together, kind people out there who think that what I believe is a bunch of hooey, you know, and it really shakes them to the core. That, that's my concern is like, um, we're, if we do that, then we're not preparing our kids to stand up in this world. And like Tamar said, to be able to dialogue in it and, and realize that God's word doesn't need protection. You know, like it's going to stand. He's promised that the word of the Lord stands forever. He says that his words are going to last longer than this earth. So the scientific um, experiment, the project is going to expire before God's word does. You know, we don't have to hedge around it and try to protect our children from seeing any other viewpoints or from learning about science or stuff like that in a misguided attempt to keep them secure in their faith. What we need is to teach them that God's word is secure and certain and it has what they need and they can always turn to it and there are no bad questions to ask. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing that we can't consider. Uh, uh, you know, that, that kind of broad view, I think, is really helpful so that they're, you know, when they get to college, they're not surprised to discover that there are smart and bright people out there who disagree with them, but they can actually listen, understand their arguments, and then, and then uh, bring them back to the word, too, and say, okay, well, what does God's word say about this? Because that's what's going to shape and form my view uh, more than anything else. So, okay, well, that was kind of a soapbox I got on, so sorry about that. You guys had to endure that. Um, let me just let Luther sum this up in a much better form than I did. And once again, Luther is going to bring the doctrine of vocation into the rescue. This is also from the large catechism on the first commandment. So Luther says, although much that is good comes to us from human beings, nevertheless, anything received according to his command and an ordinance, in fact, comes from God. So it seems like we're going to get stuff from other people, but actually it all comes from God. Our parents and all authorities, as well as everyone who is a neighbor, have received the command to do us all kinds of good. So here's the key sentence. So we receive our blessings not from them, but from God through them. So there's the doctrine of vocation. We receive blessings from God through other people, through parents, authorities, from our neighbors. Creatures are only the hands, channels, and means through which God bestows all blessings. Therefore, we should not spurn even this way of receiving such things through God's creatures nor are we through arrogance to seek other methods and ways than those God has commanded. For that would not be receiving them from God, but seeking them from ourselves. And I like this. This is exactly what I guess what I really wanted to cover in our time. Oops, I don't mean to grab all of that. What I really wanted to cover in our time together 
we should not spurn even this way of receiving such things through God's creatures. That is to say that science has a legitimate role that it can play in this world. And when we receive things, um, blessings from science, that's just fine. That's God at work. That's the doctrine of vocation. The problem is when uh, we, through arrogance, try to go to heights too high for us, things too marvelous for us to understand. When science starts to go there, uh-oh, then we got a problem. Then we got to watch out. Then it turns in to an idol. So Christians can have a very broad and encompassing um, appreciation for science and what it's brought into this world without falling into the, the trap of turking, turning um, it into an idolatry. Uh, idolatry thing. So yeah, Mark's saying, take the medicine, listen to your doctor. Right, exactly. Go back. To, we did this two weeks ago. We did the healthcare one. Same thing, you know, like um, if if uh, there's no reason that we have to say, you know, um, a million studies have been done on this drug and it actually does something that's helpful, then good. God's going to bring healing through that. Thank you, Lord. You know, um, uh, surgery, right? All of the surgeries that are performed uh, they grow and because because of what? But because scientists are studying this, you know, and the, the doctors record their operations. You can log in and watch them. They're really it's really gross to watch some of them, um, uh, but they know what they're doing. You know, it, you watch like a you log in and watch a brain surgery, and it's like a gooey mess. Um, but they know what they're doing. You know, cut this, don't cut that. <laughs> well, um, none of us are <laughs> qualified to do that. But if you're a brain surgeon, you are, and um, thank God that from that brain surgeon, you might receive all sorts of blessings. What a great and awesome thing. So that brings us to the, the hard questions we have to ask. Give examples of questions that science can legitimately explore and answer. Give, give examples of questions that science can't legitimately raise and answer. So um, I'll take you, you know, go ahead and shoot either one out. I'll take either one. Probably it's easier to go for the ones that they can't. It always seems like it's easier for us to be against something than for something, but um, take a stab at that. Okay, so Mark says the question that I can't answer, is God real? Yeah, not that that stopped people from trying all of the the ontological argument for God, so on and so forth. Is God real? Yes. Um, what happens when we die? Yeah, there's a question science can't legitimately raise an answer. In fact, um, the very definition of death proves this point. You know, um, how, does, how does the medical community define death? Well, it defines it as, I think the Harvard definition of death is now absence of waves in the brainstem. And it's no longer, you know, like it used to be. How did you define death? Well, when you stuck the mirror under the person's nose and nothing happened, that was death. You know, then it, then it was when the heart stopped beating. Now it's that, that absence of brain waves. But for Christians, the definition of death is when the soul and the body separate. And that's something that can't be, that cannot be observed by science. Nobody can observe when the soul leaves the body. God does that separating, right? And, um, at, you know, so at that point, science has to freeze. It can't happen. It can't say Anything beyond that, well, God tells us what happens afterwards. Our soul and body are separated, souls with Christ, body uh, is laid in the ground until the last day when it's raised and reunited. Science can legitimately explore anything that exists on the earth. Yeah, right. Yeah, you, all of God's creation. Think again about Psalm 8. When I consider your heavens, the work of your, your fingers. Um, yeah, this is a world that God has given back to us, and that's such an awesome thing, you know? What the world around us is like in all of its aspects, yeah, isn't that isn't that awesome? I mean, uh, there's so many there's so many things to learn about this world, so much beauty and wonder. When I teach when I teach creation, I I mean, think um, you know, just think about all of the awesome creatures that God has made, and I put a whole bunch of pictures of them up there, and you know, you say, man, God created such an awesome world. You know, you go into the of course, seventh and eighth graders get a big kick out of this. You guys might not, but you go into the nitty gritty world of insects, which is like, it's like dog eat dog world in the insect world. You know, anything morbid, horrible and horrifying happens in the insect world. Uh, it's amazing. God created all of these incredible creatures, you know, all of that, so on and so forth. And then 
Now, now I'm really on a tangent. And then we get to our idea of what heaven is like, and we think heaven is like clouds and white robes and harps and nothing else. And you're like, if God poured out this great abundance of wonder and inc an incredible creation the first time around, why do we think that when you know, he makes all things new, he's going to lowball it? <laughs> yeah, especially the bees. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yes. And yes, we can study Mars too, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. We can, um, in fact, uh, we could... Guys, you know, we could make it our one of our future missions at our Redeemer to to be the first Lutheran church to establish itself on the moon, on the moon or on Mars. You know, and if uh, if you are going to establish a Lutheran church on the moon, um, you, we could have a naming contest already. You know, first Lutheran church would really be good if you're on the moon, um, something like that, so on and so forth. Anyways, we, yes, you can you can study the solar system, so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, any others that science can't legitimately raise an answer? We've talked about um, what happens when we die. Is God real? These are questions science isn't going to be able to answer. Um, what can be observed can be legitimately explored. Ethical dilemmas concerning scientific application, not so much. Yeah, thank you, Tamar. That's that um, science is inherently supposed to be based on observation. And that is, that's where, um, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, you can get into these questions that science can answer when you move into the realm that goes beyond observation, the realm of ethics, um, or some of the other things, what happens after we die? How about the origins of this world? Well, we, nobody was there to observe it. So, I mean, science is stretching the limits when it tries to piece together, you know, what happened beforehand. Uh, what is going to happen in the future? Science can't answer all of those questions because, you know, you have to wait for them in order to be observed. So I'm thinking about maybe some of you remember when Dr. Uh, Arthur Eggert came and gave a couple weeks Sunday morning Bible study on science. I thought he did a really good job of making these distinctions about, you know, and, um, questions that science can and cannot legitimately raise and answer. It's good for us to keep that in mind as we proceed. Um, so when, when somebody idolizes science, what happens? Well, they're inclined to take the science, scientist's word on some of these questions that really science can't legitimately answer. Questions of the origins of the universe or the, the telus, the purpose of human life. You know, why are we here? Uh, what is the purpose of living? These things science can't legitimately raise and answer. Um, so this whole thing about observation just made me think about one more passage. Let me pull it up here. It's become one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's, you can whip it out and use it and sound smart in various circumstances. So tuck this one into your back pocket. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5. And the NIV, the NIV translation just mucks it up. So make sure you get the ESV out for this one. As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child. So you do not know the work of God who makes everything. And this is referring to the, the soul, right? So when uh, uh, the scriptures do not definitively answer how you get your soul, Lutherans typically have held to the view that the soul is drawn out of the parents, um, not that the other, the other view. The Catholics have typically viewed, um, have this idea that God created a whole bunch of souls. And when a new uh, a new life is conceived, he zaps a soul into that life. Um, well, the scriptures don't necessarily answer that. And what, what I love about Ecclesiast Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5 is that here Solomon has put his finger on something that science will never be able to answer. You know, we have now incredible ways to study the development of a child in the womb and the pictures and the stuff that they're able to show us about the way that a child grows is just breathtaking and incredible. It's amazing. But one thing that no one will ever be able to observe is this, the way that the soul enters that child. You know, how does the soul come to the bones in the womb of, womb of a woman with child? Um, I think it was Solomon who said that. No, it was Job who said that um, he compared he compared the what happens in the womb to um, being curdled like cheese as God brings a person together in the womb. That's such a gross image. Uh, it's amazing. But I love this verse. So it makes the point that there are some things that we just cannot observe in this world. We'll never be able to know it. And that's a good reminder for us. We don't know the work of God who makes everything. So much like Psalm 131, Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5 is saying, know your place, human. Don't go beyond what God 
has uh, revealed. Don't turn wisdom or knowledge into an idol. So um, I think this is, again, like the doctrine of vocation has come to the rescue here, and I just love it. I think this is one of the great strengths of the Lutheran Church is that we don't become uh, biblicists who just, you know, think that, that everything outside of what's in the Bible is to be cast off and dismissed and thrown away, run away from, you know, we don't become monastics and run away from the world. We live in a world that God has given back to us and we get to enjoy it and explore it. And so long as in our scientific pursuits, that what's, is what we, we go for is observation, understanding and appreciation of the world that God has given us. Well, what a great and awesome blessing that is going to be and how much more we can, um, be inspired to sing our praises to God who made this world, who put us in it, even while we don't worry about, we don't worry about things that we're not going to be able to understand or answer. So yeah, for the scientist, don't make your hypothesis into an absolute scientific proof. Yes, that is, that's where science um, runs astray is when, you know, the hypothetical becomes an, an absolute so for Christians, you know, well, we know that nothing in this world is absolutely sure and certain apart from the word of God. So that's where we take our stand. So, um, uh, and I see Danny saying here, I know Christians who prefer to believe that earth is very old and that all of God's creations did not happen in six 24 hour days. Yeah. Um, the, uh, right. And that's where, you know, that's, this is where the rubber meets the road. So um, like when I, when I approach creation, I tend to, I don't approach this. Sometimes I think we have to dive right in there. And like, if we're going to, if we're going to tackle an evolutionist and bring him to the faith, we need to attack, attack him on his, his view of creation. My advice there is start with um, redemption, start with Christ, you know, start with what God has revealed to us about our salvation being found in Christ alone. And only once, you know, only once somebody has um, received grace through Christ, and by uh, the work of the Holy Spirit has faith that holds on to the scriptures and says, the scriptures are true and can be trusted. Can you really move into any sort of meaningful discussion about the origins of this world? So um, that being said, yes, I'm, I too, I mean, you run across every single scientist you talk to is going to say uh, the evidence out there all does give the appearance of age. You know, like it's, it would be foolish for Christians to say, oh no, it, it's not really that old. Um, when, you know, everything that they, you look at and you see and you observe it with our brains, we say this looks, this looks like it's been around for a really, really long time. Now, um, how that came to be, that's the question that we can't exactly answer, can we? So, by the way, you notice this too, don't you, that as scientists have worked back towards the origins of the world, they keep adding time. And so it gets more and more billions and billions of years to the point where they've almost got us all the way back to an eternity that it's taken for us to get here. And they say it all began with a big bang, which was so powerful. It was more powerful than anything you really could imagine. You might even say it was almighty. And so in some strange way, scientists in their big bang theory have basically worked themselves all the way back to God. And they say, in order for this world to come into being the way it is, you would need something that was almighty and eternal in order to create it. It's uh, interesting. Anyways, I digress. And um, there you go. So um, I think that this was maybe less of a Bible class and more of Moldenhauer's soapbox, but so it is. God be with you. Let's uh, bow our heads and say a prayer and close our time. Lord God, give us uh, souls that are calmed and quieted like a weaned child with its mother, that we might um, rejoice in all of your good gifts, not trying to pursue knowledge in a way that would uh, usurp your own role or that would puff us up and make us arrogant and think we know better than you do. But give us that humility that, that loves your word and that trusts you wholeheartedly and that um, from that love of your word then also embraces and loves the world that you have made for us as, as we uh, study, learn, and observe it. And in so doing, um, give our thanks and our praise to you. I ask your blessing on us as we uh, live this week in this world that you have given to us. Be with us and uh, help us to live out uh, our, our faith in our vocations that you have given to us in love and service to our neighbors. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you all. We'll see you later. Signing off.